Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSP exam. We're going to go through a review of the major topics related to network defense in Domain 3 to understand how they interrelate and to guide your studies. This is the sixth of seven videos in Domain 3. Getting there. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are a wee part of our complete CCSP masterclass. It is incredibly rare to come across a system nowadays that isn't connected to a network and typically to the largest hive of villainy and scum in the world, the internet. There is huge value in interconnecting our servers, laptops, mobile devices, smartwatches, light bulbs, coffee machines, cars, and nuclear reactors. There's also huge risk. In this mind map, we're going to talk about some of the major tools and techniques we can use to protect our networks and systems. An important concept we use throughout security and definitely need to apply to protecting networks is defense in depth. We want multiple layers of controls such that if one control fails, our crown jewels, our valuable assets, systems, data are not exposed. Defense in depth means that at each layer of defense, we need a combination of preventive, detective, and corrective controls at a minimum. Another important concept, you must always, always assume that the baddies are inside your network. There is no trusted network and thus zero trust. Zero trust is a security model that assumes no user, device, or network, whether inside or outside the organization, should be trusted by default. Instead, it requires continuous verification of identity and access rights before granting access to resources. The approach of zero trust emphasizes strict access controls, least privileged principles, and continuous monitoring to minimize risk of unauthorized access, even from within the network. This model of zero trust is designed to protect against modern threats by treating every access attempt as potentially risky, right? Zero trust is all about trust, nothing, verify everything. And it plays a big part on how we should go about designing our networks these days. Okay, now onto one of the most fundamental tools in network security, firewalls. At the most basic level, the job of a firewall is to control the flow of traffic between two network segments, or a few network segments. For instance, controlling what traffic can is allowed to come in and out of, of the sketchy internet into the internal network of the organization. Firewalls have evolved significantly over the years and become a lot smarter about how they inspect traffic and make decisions as to what traffic will be allowed through or not. We'll start with the oldest, simplest types of firewalls, packet filtering firewalls. Packet filtering firewalls only inspect packet headers, looking at the source and destination IP addresses and ports against a set of rules typically defined in an access control list. Packet filtering firewalls are not very smart, but they are extremely efficient and fast and can make decisions very quickly, meaning they have very low latency and they don't slow the flow of traffic down much. They can also inspect a lot of traffic very quickly. Stateful packet filtering firewalls still only look at a packet's header, but they are a little more intelligent in that they maintain a state table, a little bit of memory that keeps a history of recent traffic through the firewall. Here's how the state table can be useful. When systems want to establish, say, a TCP connection, they must go through the TCP three-way handshake process of SYN, SYNAC, ACK. The stateful packet filtering firewall will record that these two systems have completed the handshake and established a connection. And then if either system wants to send a packet to the other, the firewall will likely allow it because the firewall knows that these systems have agreed to establish a connection. But if another system were to send a TCP packet out of the blue, out of nowhere, the firewall is likely to block it because it has no memory in its state table of these systems establishing a connection. So to simplify, if a stateful packet filtering firewall sees a packet going out, it will likely allow the reply to come back in because it remembers the outgoing packet in its state table. Packet filtering and stateful packet filtering firewalls both operate at layer three of the network. So they're pretty fast, but they're not that smart. And all the way at the very top of the OSI model, we have application firewalls. And the big advantage of application firewalls is that they can do deep packet inspection. They can inspect anything in the packet header and reassemble a series of packets to inspect the contents, the data that is being sent in the packets. This is deep packet inspection. For instance, application firewalls can scan a file being sent to look for, say, viruses. 
Application firewalls are very intelligent and can make very sophisticated decisions. However, all this intelligence comes at the cost of speed. They are the slowest type of firewall and cause the highest latency. Most modern firewalls offer the capabilities of all the firewall types we just discussed. They can make quick and simple decisions by looking at a packet header, and if necessary, they can apply much more thorough analysis by inspecting the contents of a packet. So you get the benefits of speed and intelligence where you want it. In the cloud, we can put four firewalls in a variety of locations. Virtual firewalls are software-based firewalls that are relatively cheap and easy to deploy. We use them extensively in the cloud, allowing us to filter the traffic on our networks at a very granular level. Physical firewalls are pieces of our actual hardware systems, and we use these to filter and block traffic on our network. The fact that they are physical makes them more expensive and difficult to deploy, but they are still, of course, extensively used in the cloud by the cloud service providers to control the flow of traffic in their network. Microsegmentation is the practice of dividing networks into small segments. The low cost and flexibility of virtualized infrastructures allows us to segment our networks at a more granular level. And this is where microsegmentation can become quite cost effective and a very good security control. Geofencing is the concept of using location to be able to restrict access. For example, if all of your employees are from the frozen wastes of Canada, then you could limit logins to internal systems to people that are logging in from within Canada. Moving on from firewalls and concepts like geofencing, we'll now talk about the major network monitoring tools that we use, IDSs and IPSs. And we'll start with some simple definitions. IDS, intrusion detection systems, are designed to inspect network traffic packets to detect potentially suspicious activity. And if an IDS detects something suspicious, it will raise an alarm. IPS's intrusion prevention systems do exactly the same thing as an IDS, attempt to detect suspicious activity, but then go in a very important step further. If they detect something suspicious, they can potentially block the suspicious traffic, hence preventing an attack from occurring. IDSs can work in combination with, say, a firewall to block traffic, but IPSs can detect and block traffic on their own. There are two major locations where we can put IDSs and IPSs, host-based and network-based. Host-based means that the IDS or IPS is installed on a specific host, typically a high-value server. And the IDS or IPS is monitoring just the host it is installed on. If you want to monitor multiple hosts, then you need a host-based IDS or IPS on each individual host. A network-based IPS or IPS is connected to a network segment and monitors the flow of traffic within that network segment. Now, there are a ton of different places where you can put IDS IPS sensors in the cloud. You can attach an IDS to a mirror port on a virtual switch or place an IPS in line at your major ingress egress point in and out of your network or an IDS sensor inside your DMZ network segment or an IPS capability built into one of your hypervisors or a bunch of your hypervisors or an IDS installed on various virtual machines, host-based IDSs. The list goes on and on and on. It gets even more complicated if you want a single pane of glass view that includes monitoring your on-premise environment and your various cloud services. What this ultimately boils down to is you need to think carefully about where you need an IDS monitoring capability and possibly IPS enforcement capability. And then you'll have to architect a solution that will give you the requisite capabilities. Now, let's talk about two major methods that IDS or IPS systems can use to look for suspicious activity. Pattern matching means the IPS or IDS has been programmed to look for a specific pattern. For example, a specific type of network attack. And the IDS or IPS will alert or block if that pattern is detected. The advantage of pattern matching systems is they can be fast and efficient. They can very quickly find things. But the downside is they can only detect what they have been explicitly programmed to detect, what you've built patterns into them for. The way a pattern matching IDS or IPS is told to look for a specific pattern is often referred to as a signature analysis. You can think of a signature as a unique fingerprint for a specific type of network attack. Therefore, the IDS or IPS can have specific patterns or signatures programmed into it to look for things like byte sequences in network traffic or known malicious instruction sequences, etc. 
Anomaly-based detection is a very different approach that does not rely on signatures or patterns. And anomaly-based detection is meant to address the weakness that pattern matching systems can only detect what they have been explicitly programmed to detect. With anomaly-based detection, the IDS or IPS learns what normal looks like. It establishes essentially a baseline. And then the system can look for, these systems can look for behaviors that fall outside the accepted model of behavior, behaviors that are anomalous. There are four major anomalies that can be detected. Stateful matching means the IDS or IPS looks for anomalies in the context of a stream of traffic. The IDS or IPS maintains a state table and can, for instance, detect if a system starts sending TCP packets to another system that it hasn't established a session with. In statistical anomaly-based detection, the IDS or IPS compares traffic to typical known or predicted traffic profiles to look for statistically significant anomalies from the norm. Protocol anomaly-based detection is where anomalies can be detected based on the network protocol being used. For example, certain protocols can be defined as allowed and others will be an anomaly. If an organization they might decide to allow, for instance, only SFTP secure file transfer protocol. And if FTP, or especially TFTP, trivial FTP, traffic is detected, that would be an anomaly. And the final anomaly-based detection method is known as traffic. And traffic identifies anomalies in unexpected patterns of behavior in network traffic transmitted within a session. So essentially the system knows like what does a normal transmission sequence of, of information look like, a normal sequence of traffic, and it can detect anomalies outside of that. IDSs and IPSs can also use whitelists or blacklists as a means of detecting suspicious traffic. Uh, and by the way, a much better name uh, for a whitelist is an allow list. It is a list of IPs that a system is allowed to connect to and all other IPs are blocked. And a much better name for a blacklist is a deny list. A deny list is a list of IPs that a system is not allowed to connect to, access is denied, and all other IPs are allowed. IDSs and IPSs can be programmed to inspect traffic based on these allow or deny lists. The final method that I'll discuss that IPSs or IDSs can use to detect suspicious activity is sandboxes. Sandboxes provide a safe area to run untrusted code and then observe what the code is doing, attempting to say, for instance, install malware. An IDS or IPS system could detect that an executable file is being transmitted. IDS or IPS could then take a copy of the executable and run it in a sandbox to see what the code does. And if it does something nefarious, something evil, then the IDS or IPS can alert and potentially even block the file from being sent to the intended victim system. A really cool way to detect an attacker on a network is to use honeypots or honey nets. A honeypot is a system that looks as close as possible to a real system, like a file server or a print server or a database or an industrial control system. However, the honeypot is not a real system that is meant to be used by employees or clients of the organization. Rather, the honeypot is carefully monitored, and if someone is trying to connect to it and use the honeypot, that is a very good indicator that you have someone, a threat actor on your network that is exploring and looking for systems to compromise. A honeypot is a single system, and a honey net is a whole network segment of honeypots. Honeypots and honey nets are a good way of detecting advanced persistent threats. And the final inspection method here that I'll talk about is ingress and egress monitoring. Monitoring the traffic that is coming into a network, ingress, from say the internet, or traffic that is leaving a network, egress. It's not uncommon for organizations to detect that they've had a breach by watching the traffic that is leaving, egressing their network. If traffic is going to a known bad IP address of say like a botnet server, then it's a good indication that some malware has somehow infected a company system and the malware is calling home. And the final point here in this mind map, you can never have a secure network if the endpoints, the laptops, mobile phones, iPads, Alexa devices, IP security cameras, etc are not secure. A critical part of network security is to secure to harden endpoint devices to ensure they are correctly configured, patched, and have strong authentication and so forth. There you go. That's an overview of network defense within domain three, covering the most critical concepts you need to know for the CCSP exam.